I've noticed a trend with some movies and some Broadway shows lately. I don't know if you can attribute it to um, a lack of original ideas or maybe to just the enduring popularity of the classics. What I'm talking about is not necessarily that they're make, remaking these classics into new movies, but what they seem to be doing is taking one of the characters, usually one of the bad characters, and creating a whole new story around that character. Thus, you have Elphaba of the hit show Wicked, a story or a version of how the Wicked Witch of the West came into being. This past fall, the movie came out about Maleficent, the evil fairy god mother of Sleeping Beauty. Maleficent is both a movie and a Broadway musical. But there was a third one that I noticed as well. And this one came out a couple years ago now. And that was about the wicked queen of Snow White. Shalice Theron played that wicked queen. And no one can deny that this wicked queen didn't have a healthy self-image. I mean, every day she would boldly and confidently walk up to the mirror and say, mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the fairest of them all? Or to more modernize it, mirror, mirror on the shelf, who's more beautiful than oneself? And... Every week, every time, the mirror would answer the foul but fair queen that she was indeed the most beautiful of the land. Then one fateful morning, the queen asked the same question and got the shock of her life. Instead of the mirror saying the usual answer, my queen, you are, the mirror replied, Snow White. The image of the queen had not changed, but the mirror's perception of the queen and what it reflected had changed. And now, Snow White was the most beautiful, and the queen was only second best. I don't know about you, but the mirror is not the first thing I usually go to when I wake up in the morning. You know, As much as they say that a good night's rest can make you look like a million bucks, when I look in the mirror, my face value is usually about at $1.29 in the morning there. I still haven't figured out why they call it beauty rest. And even though the mirror usually shows us a version of ourselves that we would rather not see, Most of the time, if we see some reflective surface, some mirror, we can't help but steal a glance. I mean, it doesn't matter if you're walking through Walmart or Dillard's or downtown across one of the reflective exteriors of the building. We have to take a glance and look at us and see what we're all about. Go to any workout place and find the free weights. (laughs) And you can always find people working out with the free weights, staring at the mirrors while they're working out themselves. So like the evil, wicked queen, we have to look at mirrors. We're mesmerized by what they say to us and about us. The thing is, all of us, have talking mirrors. Don't doubt me on this one. All of us have talking mirrors. Unfortunately for most of us, what we think we hear these mirrors telling us is not that we're the fairest, but instead we hear a thousand judgmental voices from our early childhood or our teen years or our adulthood telling us, that we're fat and frumpy, that we're weak and wimpy, that we're just not good enough. They're never going to make it, so why even try? Our talking mirrors are those judging voices of the past through which we still see ourselves today. That child is still in each of us that looks into the mirror and hears it saying accusingly, you? Look at you. 
You can't do that. You're not strong enough. You're scrawny. You're too slow. Your ears stick out. You're too shy to speak in class. You can't lead. That teenager in us, at least that part of us that always feels like it's 15, looks in the mirror and hears it saying vindictively, you, forget you, you've got zits, look at those braces, you wear glasses, you're not perfect, no one's ever going to love you. And that adult in us, at least that part of us that thinks it's grown up, looks in the mirror and hears it saying judgmentally, you, what a joke. Just wait till they catch on to you. You're not worth spit. You're not, you're not worthy of respect at all. As Mark carefully records in our gospel lesson today, Jesus' early ministry was all about healing. And he healed many physical diseases, fevers, blisters, crippled limbs, blindness, deafness, bleeding. A great many of Jesus' healings were also exorcisms. And however you want to understand that kind of healing today, it is evident that these were spiritual sicknesses. One of the most telling symptoms of these spiritual diseases was the cruel things that inner demon did to the human hosts and what they said and did. But as Mark mentions in this week's text, the cure Jesus effected was not just exercising the demons, Jesus also told those demons to shut up. Ever get one of those brain loops, something that just keeps repeating in your head again and again and again? I mean, sometimes it's a snippet of music, you know, sometimes I think they call it an earworm and that it just that music just keeps playing again and again. And that usually happens to me on a Sunday afternoon after a morning worship whether a song or a hymn or something like that. I'm out to the Y working out and that there's just one song or one phrase that just keeps looping again and again and again. But sometimes that brain loop is an accusatory brain loop that seems to keep beating us down. What a Christian witness you are. You're a hypocrite. What a failure of God you are. Oh, God's going to get you for that one. And that loop, that torment, that demon within us just plays again and again and again. We want it to shut up, but for some reason the replay button just gets getting pushed again and again. We would love Jesus to come to us and tell that demon within us, be quiet, shut up. We would love Jesus to break that evil mirror. Those of you who know or read things about Martin Luther, the great church reformer, know that he had his own share of demons to deal with, demons of doubt, demons of inadequacy, demons of personal sinfulness. He sought healing and relief in many different ways. First it was within the confines of a monastery, and then he sought relief within the confines of confessional and doing penance. And finally, he sought relief when he turned to God's word. And that was the only place that he found true relief in healing in one really troublesome point in his life when he was um, sequestered in Wartburg Castle, you know, there's this story where he took an inkwell and threw it at a corner of the room, the dark corner of the room, because he thought the devil was standing there hiding in that dark corner. The thing you discover about Luther is that he knew where to turn for healing. You turn to Jesus and his word. 
when the devil accuses you of hypocrisy, when the devil accuses you of uh, chokes the life out of you so that you wonder why even bother with church anymore, when the devil is tormenting you with the, that powerful loop of personal sinfulness that you hide within the depths of your soul, you turn to the one who can heal. The one who heals not only the body and the mind, but tells our spirit as well, be quiet. I am Lord, your God. Jesus has come and brings pleasure eternal. Jesus has come with healing in his wings. Jesus has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus came to be one of us, to feel the things we feel, to struggle with what we struggle with, to experience what we experience, so that he can heal that which needs healing. Jesus walked the path of sacrifice and by his death takes away from us the sins that keep tormenting us. And that healing ministry that Jesus began is carried on yet today in this world. After Jesus walked that path of suffering, death, and resurrection, he charged his disciples to carry on this ministry of healing that he had begun. God, working through his disciples, then creates the church so that through the church, the healing words of Christ and our God can be carried out into the world. Because you see, as we gather each week, God comes to us. His Spirit speaks to our spirit. His Spirit speaks to us words of confession of how we are being hypocrites, how He speaks to our weakness, to our struggles. But then He also speaks to us those blessed words of absolution I forgive you your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. God's Spirit speaks to our whole being and tells us that He will remember our sins no more. He will remember them no more. Jesus is telling the devil to shut up and stop accusing his people. Those sins are gone. You cannot accuse what is not there. God's word speaks in scripture and preaches in, and proclaims those words through the church. That's the great role of the church today, to continue the healing you are a part of that church, and your role, part of your role, is to continue that healing as well. Together, as we speak to one another the word of God, we remind each other what God has already done for us, telling us, it, reminding us that the mirrors that we see of ourselves are not true anymore. We speak scripture to each other and hear God urging us to Turn away from that mesmerizing, eye-paralyzing view of the old lies that keep popping up within us. We're in God's kingdom now. We no longer live in that tawdry carnival of hall of mirrors and all their grotesque reflections. God's word, spoken in scripture and preached in church, tells us the truth. Once you you were not a people of God, but now, now you are God's people. The great damage talking mirrors do is to convince us that we don't have anything to offer, that we don't have any gifts that are worth anything. Healing occurs when God's Spirit convinces us through faith that we see ourselves as God sees us. People with divine gifts. People with God-given beauty. 
instead of believing the lies of those talking mirrors, we hear the words of St. Paul as he crows about Jesus Christ that you are a new creation. The old is gone. Behold, all things are new in Christ. One of the best ways to help bring this healing to our neighbor is to be an encourager. Everybody loves to hear words of encouragement. Anyone not like to hear words of encouragement? Everybody hates a fault finder, but words, you can't find fault in an encourager. And it doesn't take special training to be an encourager. We simply remind one another what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. So when those old mirrors distort the divine image that God has created in us, Scripture says there's really three little steps that you need to do to break that loop. Embrace your gifts, discover what they are, employ those gifts, use those spiritual gifts that God has given you because their usefulness, their utility is found in service, and then empower those gifts. It's what Jesus was doing when he went off by himself to pray and to praise. You empower your gifts when you pray and you praise your God. Most mirrors don't lie. They tell us what we look like on the outside at any given moment. God's Spirit doesn't lie. It tells us what our insides look like at any given moment. The difference is, mirror cannot do anything about the outside. But God can and does do something about our inside. God heals. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses our human understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.